Regrets family, uh, we wanted to come to you today through a video ahead of your quarterly conversation to just share some things that we've been talking about as an investment team, Scott, Travis, and myself. And so we want to bring those thoughts. We thought it'd be helpful to do a little video for you in this format. So for some of you, you may not have uh, met Travis before, so do a quick introduction about Travis on our investment team. He's been uh, in the money management space for nearly a third of a century. I've been managing money for friends, family, and clients uh, personally, but then before that was in the mutual fund space, right, Travis? And that exactly. was out in Colorado, right? Yep. And, um, and then it was the firm, you were with a firm and then it was with Janus, right? Uh, that was bought by Janus. It was people, bought by Dreyfus. Dreyfus, okay. Yes. And then they, people may be familiar with some of those mutual fund companies. So, And one of the things about that time that Travis got aware of was just how uh, mutual funds really wire to returns, right? Constantly pushing those returns. Came out of that space and realized that quality companies, quality portfolios is really uh, a matter of really good, uh, healthy portfolio management. So we're going to talk a little bit about that. Um, but some people may not know personally about you, Travis, and all of that is that uh, you have a, a deep uh, connection with your family. Mm -hmm. And that's been a priority over your career, over your business and the like. And, um, and a lot of it's been around because of your son being a special needs uh, boy and uh, been a special tug on your heart, right, for him. And so you like to exactly. be able to have flexibility in your schedule, be at home so you can be helping with him, right? I mean, that's been a big Absolutely. priority in your life, Absolutely. right? Absolutely. Yeah. <laughs> so um, we're glad to have you on the team and Travis on our team. And so, um, so what we want to do is hit uh, five areas that we said we wanted to talk about kind of midway through the year and talk about some things we're paying attention to and uh, just give a couple of reflective thoughts on that for you today um, that I think uh, will be prove uh, helpful for you. So uh, number one would be about the economy. So we're not economists and we can't reflect and give definitive answers about what's going on in the economy. And even economists argue about that, right? And what's going on. But certainly inflation and money supply and then the vernacular out of uh, the Fed Chairman Powell is definitely parts of those, right? So um, what, what do you think of when you hear those three ideas when it comes to the economy, uh, Scott and Travis? Yeah, so I, I think um, when it comes to the money supply and inflation, there's a lot of hyperbole, right? We've got to remember that the press really wants to stoke fear and, and gather attention to their story. Whatever it is that they're trying to sell or say, they want to, want to make it as extreme as possible. Um, you know, is inflation here? Well, it certainly is in the short term. The question is, how long is it going to last? And there, you know, it's, the, the fears seem to be abating currently that it's it's going to be runaway forever. So, um, what? How is it connected with money supply? Of course, the government threw a lot of money out uh, in the in the past um, what 12, 15 months to mm -hmm. stave off uh, a bad situation with the um, pandemic. Yeah. Um, that should abate as well and then hopefully we get back to more normalized in inflation. Nobody knows exactly what inflation is going to be or, or where it is. I think you had a, yep. a good example of lumber prices that went went almost vertical and now have dropped back off a cliff. Yeah, I mean, so, people really freaked out about that, and you saw lumber price. i got to find that chart again, then it already tanked back down. And So talk about from the economy, Travis. Think about portfolio management and, and really the mistake that people make, right, when they weave too much of the economic – hearsay and all of that and speculation into portfolio management and selecting of what goes in a portfolio, what not, and all that. What's kind of your, been your observation over the years with that? It's, it's very easy to get caught up in um, looking at, at news and press and information like, like what Barry's talked about, uh, you know, rising inflation, you know, our interest rates rising too, and to make changes to your, to your portfolio based on um, those changes in, in the economy. What, what you always want to try to bring it back to are the quality nature of the businesses that you have. The companies that we have in our portfolios are designed, or the, the management teams behind those, they're best able to, to navigate challenging environments like this. So we, we dedicate our time to identifying the good companies, uh, the quality businesses, the ones that we really want to own, and then we allow those management teams to make those decisions on how they need to adjust their business to changing uh, economic environments. That's a huge point that I hope everyone really just took in. Super important. So that's number one. Let's talk about number two. 
I was talking about money flow and the choices of where money has gone. I mean, we've, we've seen this happening, but where, as you look at where money flow has been going into equities and all that, where has that been happening? What, what's been the observation, right? Uh, lots of observations on that one. It's interesting, right? I mean, you have cash, CDs, bonds, stocks, real estate, uh, commodities, cryptocurrency, you name it. Um, you know, the problem with cash is, and we hear this time and again from people, I'm tired of the bank giving me uh, nothing or a penny on my money. So people are frustrated with that. Uh, same goes with CDs. Bonds are not going to do well, and they're not set up to do well going forward, uh, given that they're low interest rates currently and only likely to increase at some point. So so people are, are wrestling with that. So it, Globally or, or at a macro level, money has found its way into equities, uh, the stock market, and uh, real estate. Right, everybody's aware of like the, the crazy things going on in certain markets of real estate, where you know people are selling homes unlisted for greater than the, the value, and so that's where the money's been going, yeah. at least from from my perspective. So yeah, what's your observation? Yeah, there, those are really the only two areas of the marketplace that that investors can go to and hope for a positive rate of return. If we're in a, a rising interest rate environment, that's that's going to cause the bond market to suffer. Certainly you can't put money in, into cash or savings accounts and expect to make anything. So the, you know, the only two places that somebody can go and hope to get a positive return are the real estate market and the stock market. We've certainly seen how both of those markets have, have uh, mushroomed over the last year, especially with the, the extra cash that's coming into the marketplace. So that's a big one. So let's jump into number three and let's talk about probably two big factors that have had an impact on our portfolios in particular. And that's really uh, biotech uh, stocks and China, the influence of China on there. And so people have different ideas about both of those. I think, you know, first of all, biotech is by its nature more volatile, right? Within the healthcare sector, you have hospitals, healthcare plans, but then you have this, this biotech and it is more volatile by nature. And we've seen that, right? And then also, uh, <laughs> need we say much about China, but I know China, Scott, you think about this and pay attention to that. So, you know, your thoughts about those two and the influences they've had on, on the portfolios of late. Yeah. So of late, um, those have been challenges in the portfolio, but we'll come back to, um, we always say we don't measure the portfolio in the short term. We, we report on it in the short term. However, we're looking at uh, how the portfolio does over a long cycle, which could be five to 10 years. So the question you gotta ask about China, even though it's holding, you know, the, our, we've got three holdings that are really China centric, uh, and then we've got a handful of holdings that are biotech centric. Both have, have held the portfolio back a little bit, but um, we look at over the next 10 years, biotech and, and China are two significant drivers for the long term. And um, you know we have quality companies in those spaces, so even though they've held back, we are, we are committed to the long term and thinking long term, which is what people should want us to do. So think about that, Travis, in a portfolio, people might think, well, why do I have any exposure to China? Or why don't I just have no pharma? And they try to pick, you know, and we've seen that with different people that come in with different portfolios. Is they say, well, this investment manager, they're they're picking and they're they're saying we're going to bet on this sector or this industry or this, and yet your experience has said, guys, that's a really tough way to go. So, own quality companies, and why do we hold them in those sectors, even though, gosh, maybe it hasn't been all that great right. in the near term, like Scott has said. Well, it certainly helps us create better balance across the the whole portfolio. Not not every sector is going to perform well over short periods of time. Um, Certainly there are some areas that are going to do better than others. China is just one of those that for, you know, bigger political re reasons, global macroeconomic reasons, it's, it, it hasn't uh, kept pace recently. And then also with biotech, uh, biotech companies are, they are volatile, but they tend to have um, uh, period, uh, periods of performance that do better over longer periods. So. You know, even though they might be out of favor in a, in, a, in a current period or a short period of time, we still want to have exposure to those kinds of companies and, and all of the, the distribution of companies that we have because over full market cycles, they tend to perform better. 
And we try not to let those kind of short-term waves really sway us, right? Not move us or give us knee-jerk reactions, but stay steady, right? Yeah. If they're quality companies, even in those sectors, we like to hold those. We want to hold those quality companies in there, even though in the short term, you know, whatever that might be. All right, so let's jump to number four now, and let's talk about exactly that, non-quality companies and the rotation that we've seen to value. But it's really what I'd like to say about that, and my observation is, it's been the value rotation to non-quality companies. And it's really the tying those two together. Because some people might say, well, I want to own value in my companies and in my portfolios. And can I really get away from non-quality, which you can. But it's really been a, 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 a flood towards both of those in conjunction, really over the last year, and in particular, the last six to nine months, right? So uh, observations about that. Yeah, and we'll come at it from different angles, like we always, sure. always, always do. do. Yeah. All three of us do. Great. Um, but I think... You know, if, if we rewind the clock to uh, last March, right, fears in the air, um, one thing that is important for investors and, and everybody in the stock market is to not make knee-jerk reactions. And, and owning quality companies that are, are fairly priced is powerful to stay the course in the midst of those kind of storms. So what, what happens is the quality companies tend to do a, a, a good bit better in times of fear relative to non-quality companies. And then when we get to a period like we've been in over the past six to nine months where people seem to have thrown caution to the wind, then non-quality tends to do better than quality. But over time, it's the quality companies that tend to do better over full cycles and long periods of time because they've got competitive advantages, because they're stronger, they can navigate the downturns, gain market share, and, and the like. So that's that's why we stay with quality through every environment throughout the cycle. Mm -hmm. um, and and so value, I think you'll talk about, you know, what's the right way to think about value versus traditional, mm -hmm. you know, definitions of value. Right. Well, quality, it's, I think it's important to remember that quality is always attractive to investors. Um, there Again, there might be short periods of time where quality companies underperform but over long cycles, over full market cycles, quality companies are the ones that investors are most attracted to. And it's not just about pricing or valuation. A quality company is one that has a sustainable competitive advantage. It's one that, that is uh, ahead of the competition in terms of the products, the services that they offer. They tend to have uh, great levels of profitability, great revenue growth, and good financial health. And all of those things help that company have the market share to work their way through challenging environments. What we often see in periods of downturn, like what we saw at the start of COVID and, and in other periods, you know, going all the way back in my experience to the dot-com bubble and the credit crisis, um, quality companies tend to go down less than the broad market. They will go down, but they, go, they tend to go down less and they tend to recover faster. Over this last year though, with the massive amounts of stimulus that have been flowing into the market, the money supply increasing as much as it has, that has risen the, the tide for all boats. And so with all of that money going into real estate and the stock market, it's propped up the valuations of, of everything. We don't buy companies that are cheap uh, just because they're inexpensive. That often leads to buying a, a low quality company or a company that doesn't have a sustainable advantage. So there's more more that goes into it than just price. Absolutely. So that takes us to number five, and I think Travis, you've just elaborated on the important part that we focus on, which is quality, mm -hmm. um, which you highlighted some of those pieces. But let's talk then about why quality matters over the long term, even if in the short term it appears that oh maybe quality's not working this month, this quarter, this year for the reasons we've just highlighted, right? Mm -hmm. But why does it benefit the investor to stay in those quality companies despite this you know a short-term blip on the screen and what does that do not only for the investor returns but also for the psychology when you think about that right and uh, and then scott gives your observations as well sure so with um with a, with a high quality company there th again it's not just about the numbers it's understanding the company understanding the business that they're in and knowing that the management team that's responsible for that company that they've been through trying periods, that they've been through difficult environments. And maybe it's been cycles or environments that they've never seen before. I think it's safe to say that, that none of us have ever experienced anything like what we did 
with COVID and shutting down the base, the effective shutting down of the economy. But those quality businesses, those skilled management teams, they know how to navigate their business through those difficult environments. When you know that you own quality businesses, it, it does, it plays into your psychology. When you see investments going down in value, but it's a company you know and it's one that you understand, it's a business that you believe in, you're better able to hold it through those difficult and challenging periods. And let me give an example of that, and it's got you way in on that, because one of them that comes to my mind as you're talking, Travis, is Disney. Mm -hmm. Here's a behemoth of a company that is essentially an in-person uh, uh, amusement park mm -hmm. driven business, and then in a matter of months, this leadership team figured out how to go to streaming as a significant source of their revenue and did an amazing job. Um, so that, is, to me, is a great example through this past year to exactly what you're, you're talking about yes. there. So, Scott, your thoughts? Yeah, I mean, it, it, you know, in your expertise over, as Grace said, nearly a third of a century. I know that sounds strange. <laughs> are you that old? Maybe you are. <laughs> I'm feeling it. I'm feeling it, yes. I, I have more fair hair, Travis. But, um, no, I mean, you know, it's why we don't, you know, we, we don't do timing because we don't think that works. It's very difficult to get right time and again if you try and time. Uh, we, we don't so much pay attention to growth or value in the traditional sense. Um, we don't think about picking, oh, this is the industry that's gonna be right or wrong over time. What, what is clearly uh, demonstrated in, in the data and research is if you stick with quality, quality has the tendency over long periods of time to outperform. So that's why we stay hyper focused on that, and we have a process that keeps us, um, you know, focused on what matters. Yeah, yeah, holding true to that. Mm -hmm. So that quality can be a confidence boost to us. It can be a confidence boost to you by knowing what you own and why you own it. And when you know what you own and why you own it, you can stick through it through the ups and downs and through the short term waves and through the noise and the media and all that happens. So um, stick with it, understand it and uh, we'll talk more about it during our visit. So as, as we wrap up, what I think is really important is that everyone has a good feel for how much they're in equities versus how much they're not. You have safe money, and so somewhere between 40 and 70% of your money can be in equities, and you can weather the storm depending on your risk tolerance, depending on how much income you have coming in from reliable sources, depending on how much cash you have, depending on your lifestyle. All those things we talk about on a regular basis are so absolutely critical because we have no idea what the returns are going to be or what the market's going to do or what the economy is going to uh, do to the market over a one-year, two-year, three-year period. We don't know. But over the long haul, those quality companies win. So making sure you have that you know, access to safe money, cash, income can allow you to weather that through the time and not worry about this timing thing because you will lose mm -hmm. right paying attention uh, to the timing thing so uh, owning that and having that in place will be a big piece so that's something we want to talk about as we get into the quarterly conversations in particular making sure you're comfortable so that not if but when right not if but when there's a 10 20 30 40 god forbid more than 40 percent pullback you're ready you're prepared and there's no, uh, there's no uneasiness because we're ready for that, right? Mm -hmm. So um, that's what you need to do as you look forward and as you think about this area so you can be confident. So any kind of final words about how they maintain confidence and what they need to remember uh, going forward? Hopefully we have great, great positive returns over the next 3, 6, 9, 12, and forever never a negative return. But we know that's not the case. So kind of parting thoughts in that area. Well, just to tie into what you said, Barry, I think the – the, the best thing you can do is is own those companies that you you know them you understand them and you just expect you have expectations that the management of those businesses that they they know their businesses well enough to carry them through a difficult period and and you let them do their job they tend to be very very good at it yeah and I if we, if we stay focused on quality and we have a unique uh, plan for each of you that you understand what your what your path is to navigate a downturn so you can leave the quality company investments alone and recover, you'll, you'll enjoy the long-term reward uh, of staying in it with the quality companies. 
It is our pleasure to serve you and help you accomplish your goals, your objectives with great confidence and peace of mind. And as your investment team works for you and looks at this on a day-to-day -day basis, minute by minute, so you don't have to, it's our pleasure. So thanks for uh, listening in. Hope you found this valuable, and we'll talk to you soon.